Good Recording morning in welcome. progress. I am Margie McDonald with Big Sky 55 Plus. We are honored to welcome five Montanans whose lives are closely touched by House Bill 649 and its importance. I'm pleased to introduce today to you Representative Mary Caffaro, who is the sponsor of House Bill 649. Wes Thompson is the administrator of Valley View Nursing Home in Glasgow, Montana. And David Trost is here from Billings, Montana. David is our CEO of St. John's United in Billings, um, a senior community, um, the whole continuum of care, including Medicaid patients. And um, David is pinch hitting today for Jason Trost or Jason Cronk, who had to got caught up in a storm related travel thing. Um, and then John and Carol Harwood are here from um, Joliet. John and Carol are parents whose adult child lived in a group home for adults with developmental disabilities. And this bill includes a number of groups who are served through our provider rates. So let us get started with uh, Representative Mary Caffaro, um, our sponsor. She is from Helena and she will brief you on the status of the bill and what it covers and the path forward for this very critical piece of legislation. Uh, go ahead, Mary. Okay, thank you for organizing the press conference, Big Sky 55 Plus. And I wanted to, am I, uh, am I off mute? You're off yeah. mute, you're good, Mary. Okay. You're all good. Okay, I, uh, so thank you to Big Sky 55 Plus for organizing the press conference. And thank you to all the people are, who are here to speak about the impacts of an underfunded Medicaid system by the state of Montana. House Bill 649 funds the uh, Medicaid provider rates at the benchmark identified by the governor's cost study, the Guidehouse cost study. We spent almost $3 million on that study, and it was uh, data-based. The Guidehouse is a, has a really good reputation across the country nationally for doing solid work. But again, the uh, goal was to find out how much it costs to do business in Montana, delivering healthcare as a Medicaid provider, and then to base decisions not on politics, but on data. House Bill 649, that's exactly what it does. A couple of things I wanna make clear. The people whose lives would be impacted are people with developmental disabilities, children and adults, people who have mental illness, children and adults, people who have physical disabilities, children and adults, foster care children, senior citizens, I think that I covered all of the, the broad spectrum of people that would be impacted positive, positively if this bill were to pass. Right now, House Bill 649 is in the Appropriations Committee waiting for a revised fiscal note based on some amendments that were put on in the committee. As you know, we're getting to a very important deadline. We're up against a deadline with that bill. All of the bills in the House need to be transmitted to the Senate by Tuesday. So working hard to get the new fiscal note from the governor's office for the budget office, and then we will take executive action on appropriations and see whether or not that bill makes it out of committee. Hopefully it does. One thing that's really important is that it is critical that we fully fund these services at the benchmark. We need to fully fund it because our state is in crisis from a decades long underfunded system. A couple of quick points. One is, the government always takes care of itself. For example, the very same issues that the pro private sector providers are experiencing and is impacting services are also happening to the state. The difference is in the executive budget and now the legislative budget, the state's taken care of. Their inflation is taken care of, their operations costs, their technological needs, uh, the present law increases, for wages, et cetera, all of that is taken care of in the budget. I think that community providers should be treated exactly the same. They're suffering from the same issues. The other piece that I wanted to bring out is the community providers did not come to the legislature and ask for this increase. This increase is solely based on the data identified in the Guidehouse study. This is not initiated by the providers. And therefore, all the providers are asking for is what the study has indicated is the cost of doing business. That's it. This is not provider driven. Providers are asking for a fair shake. 
and should be treated fairly and equally with the government. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is the increases that have happened so, so far in the budget show just how underfunded the system is. They do not show a unreasonable amount of money going out to providers. I ask that everybody on this call and anybody who's list, who is listening continue to fight hard so that we can keep a Montana system in place that works well for the providers who have been here, some for over 100 years, many for decades, doing this tough work. They've been with us through the pandemic. They've been with us through the ups and downs of budget cuts, no rate increases, 1% rate increases. We need those providers in place for the community infrastructure for the people who we love so much and need the care. And with that, I, I will conclude it, with the exception to say thank you to all of the press who have taken such an interest in, interest in Montanans and who continue to. We really need you to help us get the word out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And um, for, for the reporters who are on, we will um, give you an opportunity to ask questions of Mary and all of our panelists at the um, end of our very short presentation. So it'll be a few minutes and you'll be able to raise your hand and we'll we'll bring you in one by one. So um, we're so glad you're here. Uh, next, I'm very happy to welcome David Trost from um, Billings, Montana. David is the CEO of St. John's United, and um, he is um, zooming in from, from, as I said, from Billings. And so David, um, welcome, and thank you for being here across the miles, as it were. Uh, thank you, Margie, and thank you, Representative Cafaro. Um, Representative Cafaro, you mentioned that the providers um, didn't ask for this, and I just want to say that, you know, two years ago we did. Two years ago in the legislative process, we asked for uh, for better and more um, appropriate and fair um, reimbursement, and instead we received a less than 1% rate increase um, at that time, two years ago. And uh, we had some hope at that time because it was the legislature who at that time then said they would do this rate study. And so we all took a pause and said, thank you for doing the rate study. And so um, that's where we're at with what uh, Representative Caparo had just mentioned. Over the weekend, you know, I had a chance to meet with some churches from across Southeast Montana. And they posed some really good questions. And they asked if closed nurse, they asked if the closed nursing homes would reopen. Uh, keep in mind, you know, 25 Eastern Montana hospitals, Southeastern Montana hospitals were in my presence. And that's the question that they asked me. Uh, would, it, would the nursing homes reopen if these rates were to change? I said, you know, I can't speak for all of them, but I wouldn't reopen them. I said, sure, reimbursement rates are not high enough to cover costs. But after closing a facility, um, it'd be nearly impossible to rebuild the core staff to operate in these workforce conditions. Um, and in addition to that, you'd want to re return to a would you want to return to a place of employment that had the risk of closing again? What providers need is predictability to make decisions. Historically, we had predictability. Unfortunately, it was low reimbursement and no rate increases, but that was predictable, <laughs> um, which is kind of sad. Um, and then as, as time went on, those predictable no rate increases really were the tipping point with this last inflationary surge for these providers to say we have to close. And that's what's happened. To reopen means predictability. Sure, rates will likely increase through this legislature, but if they are only nine, if they increase only to 90% of the average pre-hyperinflation cost, I like that word, by the way, average pre-hyperinflationary costs, uh, without statutory adjustments with <coughs> the legislation, I can't recommend to anyone to also reopen a nursing home. Then there are the one-time costs to reopen as well, including the fill-up time, the training, updating to current building codes, and reimbursement rates won't touch that. So another funding mechanism has to have help with the reopening costs. Remember, the current 
state of this legislation, this legislature, not Mary's bill, but the legislature and House Bill 2 will only fund up to about 90% of the provider rate study rates. So you have to ask yourself, okay, another question, will we see the nursing homes that close reopen? Um, or it will nursing homes continue to close? Unfortunately, my response to that question that the folks asked, they said, okay, nursing homes, um, you won't reopen the nursing homes, but will you continue to see closures? I said, unfortunately, I think we might, but at a slower rate. Some nursing homes have been waiting on the sidelines to see what happens with this legislature. Uh, if this legislature passes a 90% of provider rate study at, um, reimbursement, then that only helps um, those that are less than the average. That means a majority of the nursing homes are still have costs that exceed those averages. St. John's is currently in the process of closing approximately 60 nursing home units for only one reason, the ability to recruit a workforce. With the reimbursement we have, we can't pay staff um, to compete with other competing um, organizations. And I'm not even talking about the hospital. I'm just talking about Walmart and Target and, and, um, and the McDonald's down the street. We can't compete to pay though, uh, compete against those wages. And I personally would rather work in a less stressful environment, less, uh, less emotionally, um, um, a traumatic environment uh, that to make the same amount of money than to work as a CNA in a nursing home where you're giving so much of yourself and trying to take care of your family and have a career caring for our elderly. And this is beyond just nursing homes. It's about all those that are institutionalized in various settings, um, children and adults that are living in group care and group foster <clears throat> care. The costs are high. And so with that, I will conclude and wait for questions later, Marty. Oh, thank you, David. Appreciate it. Um, uh, next, I'm very happy to welcome John and Carol Foreman, who um, live in Joliet, Montana, and are parents um, of, of uh, an adult who, um, child who, was, who lived in, in a group home uh, for adults with developmental disabilities. And I think, um, Carol, are you planning to go first? I think John's going to do the speaking. Okay. Good, answer questions. Yeah. Good to know we can hear you. We, we had a little technical stuff, so I'm thrilled I can hear you. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. By the way, our last name is Harwood. And oh, Harwood. We, I'm yeah, sorry. Okay. That's okay. No, I apologize. <laughs> that, I got that, wrong in my notes there. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, that's fine. I've been called a lot of things, so that's okay. So. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to re represent families and individuals with long-term cognitive, developmental, emotional, and mental health needs. Long-term health care is difficult and complex and expensive. It cannot be done alone. Both Carol and I, uh, both Carol and our lives have been blessed by four children and eight grandchildren. Our second son, Craig, was born with all these health care needs. <clears throat> Professionally, personally, and voluntarily, we have been actively involved in the care, support, and advocacy of families with disabilities, people who have been abused, and in seeing communities and community-based services improved. Historically, many of the citizens with these disabilities were forced to live on the streets. They found shelter in cheap motels or worked on family farms or in small family businesses. Many were cared for by Good Samaritans, parachurch organizations, excuse me, and, and supported by charitable giving of individuals and businesses. Thousands were sometimes inhumanely locked in state facilities at Boulder Warm Springs. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thousands were sometimes inhumanely locked in state facilities at Boulder Warm Springs in our, and in our state prisons. 
1965, our federal government created Medicaid to fund services for people with disabilities. In 1971, on a Shelby High School sociology trip, uh, I remember asking our tour guide why someone, said, someone didn't do something to help these people. I distinctly remember hearing no reply. Since that time, our son Craig was born. In 1990, Governor Stan Stevens authorized a Medicaid waiver to begin a pilot project funding community-based services for children with multiple disabilities. Today, we are here to talk about the essential role of Medicaid funding in protecting, supporting, and sustaining our children, our families, our schools, and our communities. Montana nonprofit healthcare professionals have been delivering quality care to our loved ones and our neighbors for over half a century. Unfortunately, this system is struggling to cover the costs of doing business and their budgets are hemorrhaging. The Medicaid Behavioral Health Study clearly outlines the existing and growing disparity between operational costs and Medicare and Medicaid rates. Compassionate Montana citizens, local government, state government, and organizations have worked to build a system of community-based services for individuals with disabilities. The system is not perfect, but has proven to be cost-effective and welcome in the communities served, uh, they serve. <clears throat> Hospitalization, institutionalization, and incarceration are more expensive and often prove inhumane. Within Montana's continuum of care, these services provide a safety net and provide treatment to stabilize and return the individual to her or his community. Past administrative and legislative actions have harmed this system. Population growth, demand for services, workforce shortages, and inflation threaten to strangle the very services created to help individuals with disabilities. Providing reliable Medicaid funding to Montana nonprofits health and healthcare businesses is essential for our communities, and for our nonprofit businesses, this funding will provide safety, stability, structure, and staff. For our Montana citizens with disabilities, this funding will provide community, respect, dignity, growth, development, and love. For Montana families with Medicaid funding, it brings us, this funding will bring us peace of mind knowing that our loved ones are being cared for, which allows us to be moms, dads, sisters, brothers, grandmas, and grandpas. It gives us opportunities to love and nurture the rest of our families and our jobs and our communities. In closing, may we all just think and consider the wisdom found in the book of Romans. Now we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. In the words of King David, may we also ask, are not there any that I may show the kindness of God to? Uh, thank you. We'll answer any questions later. Thank you so much, John and Carol and Harwood, H-A-R-W-O-O-D. I know I had that in our, um, in our uh, announcement, so I apologize. Um, we have one last speaker for you, and we're very happy to bring in um, Wes Thompson, who's the administrator a Valley View nursing home up in Glasgow, where I guess there's some snow. So we're um, seeing John call in from his telephone today. And John, we're so, I mean, Wes, thank you. Um, I'll get my name straight here eventually. But Wes, thank you for being here. Thank you so very much for having me. And thank you so much, Representative Caffaro, for putting this together for us. Uh, I am, uh, fortunate to be here to discuss Valley View Home and what we are currently going through. I've spent uh, almost 26 years now in health services and business management. I was fortunate enough to be given the role as administrator with Valley View Home in 2018. And I sat down with my wife and the first thing that we do is we look at the economical impact uh, we also look at uh, United States uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and U.S. Census Bureau so that we know what we're getting into. Um, the moment we 
we started working at Valley View Home, we were quickly given the education that Valley View was close to shutting its doors down unless we were somehow elected to have a, a, a tax levy throughout the county of Valley County. So before I even uh, understood uh, my full role, I was already out lobbying in town hall sessions over and over trying to and get the community to understand the importance of long-term care and the the, the uh, continuous curriculum of health services that and the importance of having a nursing home in your county. We were very fortunate to get that in 2018. And at the end of 2018, it still appears that we lost uh, close to $600,000 that one year. By, 2000, by the end of 2019, we became highly efficient, more efficient than, than imaginable. You name it, utilities and employees. We, uh, we quickly identified our retained staff and the ones that we knew could take on extra roles of responsibility. We significantly increased their wages while significantly increasing their responsibilities and, and uh, other duties throughout the home. By the end of 2019 was the first year that Valley View Home did not end up in the red at the end of the year since 2001. And we knew that we had a ship that was stable and it was not leaking. Come the pandemic, we sank. We are sunk. Right now, we are only standing by because we receive grant funding through the USDA, through the EHC tax credits. Those are the only reasons why we are open right now. And we are trying so des desperately to continue to support Valley County and to support our neighboring county, Phillips County, because the Malta nursing home is also shut down. Now, again, 25 years in healthcare and business and looking into this, it was quite obvious that the state of Montana has a myriad of manufacturing, agriculture, and health services. Manufacturing and agriculture have been strong for over 30 years. And it's predicted, according to the US DLS, that it's going to continue to be strong, but it's not gonna increase. The one out of the myriad is health services. That is going to have to significantly increase three years ago, and no one is paying attention. I am an investor, and because of my head in business, my wife tells me to shut up every chance she gets. But I am telling you, the state of Montana needs to seriously invest in health services. And that means uh, educating, employing, and retaining health services employees, from laundry aid to registered nurses. This needs to be the state of Montana's investment. Instead, we continue to have to battle. So I am here to help Representative Cafaro and hope that HB 649 pulls through. If it does not, I assure you, Valley View Home will not be around for the next few years. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, we so appreciate your taking the time to visit with our reporters. Um, at this point, uh, we are open to have you raise your hand on the Zoom and we will um, give you uh, the uh, open up your mic so that you can ask a question. I see Mara Silvers um, is uh, now, um, Mara, the, the voice is on. So please go ahead with your question. Thanks you very much for doing this. Your journal too. Yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Mara. I write for Montana Free Press about health and human services. Um, this is for any of the of the people on the panel, but I'm I'm curious to hear um, what a little bit about what some of the conversations have been like with lawmakers on House appropriations, on on other uh, budget committees who haven't been um, so so far supportive of funding rates to the level recommended in the Guidehouse study. Um, beyond perhaps Representative Cafaro, because I know that those are your colleagues who you work with every day, uh, for the people who are frontline workers or or um, who, who use these services, um, tell us a little bit about some of those conversations. I think Does I saw mind if I jump in on that one? Wes, do you want to jump in first? I would love to, if that's okay. Yeah. And then we'll sure. let others come yeah. in. House Appropriations Vice Chair represent, uh, uh, Bob Keenan, would continuously bring up 
the simple fact that the state of Montana provided $15 million of funding to all long-term care facilities in May of 2021. And what upsets lowly administrators like myself is that that is almost a bragging point or uh, something to show that the state has actually continued to support us. And, and believe me, we are very fortunate we received that $15 million in May of 2021. However, with the closure of 11 nursing homes, I think that's pretty evident it was nowhere close to the mark. A second portion is Representative Jane Gillette, uh, who cut me off in the middle of my answer to her question last time I was there two days ago. Um, and I professionally stopped talking and walked away from the podium. Uh, but she brought up the, the point that many representatives are continuously asking, how come nursing homes aren't massively increasing their private pay rates? The answer is this. First off, in order to, uh, to put a massive increase to Medicaid rates, uh, to, I'm sorry, to private pay rates, you need to have some supportive reference. And so my board of directors and I unanimously agreed to wait until the Guidehouse study was actually published. The Guidehouse study should have been published in May of last year. It wasn't published until November. I'm glad that it was late because they did go through and they went through the cost reports of 2021, uh, and which also showed you know, how much more that is required. But the moment that was published, my board and I quickly turned and sent letters to all nine of my private pay residents stating that there has to be an increase of $50 per day for all of them. And in that letter, the last paragraph stated that we will also have to do yet another increase come July of 2023 once we are aware of what the new published Medi Medicaid rate is. And so those are the two issues that I've had on the five times now that I've spoken with representatives. I hope that answers your question, Ms. Silvers. Thank you very much, Wes. And um, Mara, if you, if you want to follow up, I don't see another, any other hands up. Others, if you want to get in the queue, you feel free to I put I think it John in. wanted to respond as well. Yeah, go ahead, John. I would like to respond to that. Uh, I've been active in Helena for over 30 years. And, and during that time, there has always been a desire to limit spending for health care. Uh, that I'm, I'm a rural conservative myself, and it has always been a, a struggle to get people to see the importance of this perfect storm that has developed. And you can see that in nursing homes closing, and group homes closing six years ago uh, at, at the session, uh, many of us were very angry and frustrated and uh, uh, with the lack of funding and it has just continued uh, speaking as a Republican and, and for Republicans who support uh, services for people with disabilities and uh, services in nursing homes. Uh, we recognize that these services are needed. We recognize the contra contractual obligations that have been made by the state of Montana to fund these organizations. Uh, they have, uh, uh, our Republican party has, has historic raised the historic, historically they have raised Medicaid to 90% of the level of uh, where the where this study that uh, this guide post this guide house study was, and I think they're quite comfortable uh, at that number uh, with the fact that these raises have come in. But there are people within the administration, uh, state administration, and within the supermajority that the party has that realize that we, we need to fully fund these services. And uh, it really is a crisis, not only in and the services for disabled, but within our 
within our correctional system and they're intertwined. And so I would just, uh, Ms. Silvers, I just encourage you to continue your fine reporting and get the word out that that people need to support uh, this funding. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I do see that Kayla's got her hand up, so we will bring her in for a question. Good morning, this is Kayla Spaller with the Daily Montana. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Kayla. Thank you. Um, I wanted to I wanted to check in with um, with David Trost about the units that are closing. I'm not sure I caught the number if it was um, if it was 60, and then also find out if the bill passes if uh, that would stop the the closures and what type of units. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Kayla. My um, uh, you know, the response, the comment I made was that we are in the process of closing uh, 60 units um, that, you know, there's also been this conversation of why are there so many licensed units versus um, unlicensed units uh, or licensed units that aren't occupied versus, you know, just this whole conversation about occupancy percentages. We currently sit on about 70 um, empty um, nursing home units. And those units are are empty um, primarily because we can't find the staff to um, to fill those. And the and I don't see that improving anytime soon. And so we are repositioning our our service lines to better meet the needs of our of our of our clients. And so we will be uh, permanently closing. Uh, probably around 60 of those units, and um, but they we they're not hard to close because currently we have over 70 that are just sitting empty. That uh, we could be serving folks if we had the staff. We potentially could have had the staff if this if the reimbursement was um, uh, was more stable in the last four years. But um, due to the pandemic over the last three years, people leaving the business, the industry, as workforce, as well as those who have retired early, there's just the sheer number of human beings to provide care has reduced. And so it's a mathematical problem. I don't see our ability to actually recruit staff um, to increase the numbers. I can only try to pay our current staff enough to keep them from leaving. Thank you, David. Um, I see also that um, uh, Representative Caffaro has some comments she wanted to footnote on these questions. So go ahead, Mary. Thank you. I almost said thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my comment is I think that John and Carol have seen over the years, the changes in services and the transition from inst from nothing to institutionalization and then the focus on community services. And we all know that all people, and in particular in your case, people with dis developmental disabilities thrive. It, they can reach their potential. They, they can be completely integrated into the community working being able to have friends like everybody else and live a life like everyone else with the proper supports. And the reason I bring that up is <clears throat> we've heard many reports in committee about the impacts of an underfunded system from children being shipped out of state who are in crisis, mental crisis, or children with developmental disabilities being shipped out of state where it costs more money. Of course, the closures of the nursing home, lines of services being completely eliminated, group home closures and people sleeping in wheelchairs because they don't have a worker to come help them get to bed or get up in the morning and get to work. And so I wanted to read to you an impact statement that was provided for us by the biggest provider in the state aware. They provide services for people with developmental disabilities, mental health, Alzheimer's, dementia, all ages, cradle to grave. And what the impact statement of an underfunded system provided by aware here it goes, 10 closures of group homes in the past five years, four in 2023. So four group homes just in 2023. As far as their workforce goes, 
they have laid off 100 people. They have the bed capacity in their group homes for 210 people, but only can serve 160 at this time. And this is most important. This is the most important point because it hits us all right in the heart. They have exited 2,500, 2,500 people from their services without any referral, without any referral because there were no existing providers to refer them to. That's just one provider. Thank you so much, Representative. Um, and I also neglected to give um, Kayla or um, uh, Mara an opportunity to do any follow-up. So, um, Kayla, did you have a follow-up question? I think I'm okay. Thank you so much for uh, doing that. Good, okay. Um, Ma uh, May Maya Pan, seven, if you'll tell us who you are and um, you're, you're up, you're up. And it looks like you're still muted. Sorry, Eleanor Guerrero, Carbon County News, Red Lodge, Montana. Oh, uh, hi, Eleanor. Hi, Representative Cathero. I've been writing about this issue, so glad to hear you're on it. Um, and I've been following you. Uh, I would like to get the names and titles of the people who are speaking so that we can be accurate in the article. Uh, and I also just wanted to say that this uh, local a Red Lodge nursing home, Cedar Woods, uh, cannot ever be reopened because they sold the building. So places may not exist anymore. And we only have two in the county, they've both closed. So this is urgent for our county and we appreciate you being on this issue. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Eleanor, for all your good reporting and journalism. I always appreciate seeing the Carbon County News. And um, One Tully, more I, I think you have, Eleanor signed in, so we will be able to send her that list. Is that correct? Uh, one more thing, if I may. Um, the um, issue is something I personally experienced. I cared for my dad at home for five years and it was grueling. I worked full time, it almost broke me. So I cannot imagine having a family and trying to care for someone at home. I really understand the issue, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank bringing that up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of footnote that with the um, the thought that one of the things I see happening is this, um, I think, temp to almost, it's almost as if some of the discourse is trying to pit home and community-based services against skilled nursing facilities and services. And, you know, in terms of the kinds of um, spectrum of, of appropriate care, and level of care and acuity of care, we can't sort of argue that there's one, that we can do one without the other. It's all, it all needs to be supported. And, and we have both home and community-based as Keeley wrote so well about this last weekend um, at Kaiser Family Foundation, as well as the, the um, residential um, skilled care for some of our more frail and vulnerable and, um, uh, elders and people uh, with disabilities. So it's not one against the other. They are related. Yeah. Margie, I was wondering if I could um, just uh, provide a little feedback to Eleanor specifically on Carbon oh, County. Oh, please. Yeah, thank uh, you. You know, yeah. Carbon County is um, very near and dear to me because we actually have an assisted living facility there called the Willows. And uh, we have an ownership um, church that also is there in Carbon County uh, called um, Messiah Lutheran um, Church. And um, the Willows is a 24 unit assisted living facility that can own that we only have 10 patients in, but we have demand off the charts for Medicaid patients. And we could fit in so, but the Medicaid rates are at such a level, we only limit our uh, Medicaid there to about two or three at a time. But we only have 10 patients in a 24 unit facility, even after the closure of, of the nursing home, because the nursing home had all Medicaid patients. So we could have taken care of quite a few of those patients if the reimbursement rates for assisted living were also higher. And so, um, um, and again, in Carbon County, staffing's an issue in a ski resort community like that. Uh, staff are often transient and they move in and out. And so that 
makes it hard to stabilize uh, workforce as well. So, um, but anyway, I, I feel your pain, um, Eleanor, and um, appreciate you covering this and um, know that um, St. John's is struggling in Carbon County as well. May I thing, Margie, real yeah. quick? Go ahead. I, want, I would like people to be hopeful. And I'll tell you why. The, the legis there are lots of legislators that care very deeply about this issue and they care very deeply about the people back home. And a good illustration is when House Bill 649 was on the floor, it passed second reading 65 to 35. That is a really good majority. And so please don't give up hope. Thank you, Mary. We needed that. And that is why um, we hope that the uh, lawmakers will have another opportunity um, to uh, to vote right, to vote right on this bill, which is just absolutely critical. Um, mm -hmm. I see that Mara has her hand up again. Am I correct? Mara, do you want to come back in? Yeah, thank you. Now, now I'm unmuted. Um, I was just wondering, I think to, to that point from Representative Cafaro, if anybody could speak about any other bills um, that are working their way through the session that you have your eye on, maybe maybe this is a question for Wes and for David that could somehow help um, help help you pr continue to provide these services or other, I guess, other regulatory reforms, rules, changes, anything else that's on the landscape that um, that either gives you hope or um, is something that you are I don't know, passionate about digging in on. I would like to discuss HB 891, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, House Bill 891 is uh, sponsored by Representative Jennifer Carlson from Belgrade. Um, what this does is it provides a one-time $40 million payment to the nursing homes. And there's only 60 plus of us left at this point. Uh, this one, I, I want to say I'm hopeful about, but unfortunately, the vibe I received while I was in legislation two days ago was they were going to pound this to the ground and turn it into flour. Um, but what it would do and what I am hopeful is that it would provide us not just funding, but if we were to receive that bill on top of HB 649 from Representative Cafaro, we would receive a Medicaid rate that could keep me operational on a day-to-day -day basis. And the other bill would actually give me a little bit of funding so that I can fight against Panda Express. I went there yesterday. It's $23, $23 an hour is what the starting wage is. My CNA start off at $16 an hour. And that's that's the big difference between those two. And, and while I'm on the horn, I do just want to put out a stupid numbers thing. It's what I do. Um, if a average sized nursing home between the size of 70 to 120 beds closes, it would take almost a million dollars to close it voluntarily and appropriately and professionally. If it actually closes, it would cost approximately three million dollars to reopen. I just hope everybody listens to those numbers and understand once these facilities close, it's it's almost impossible to get them back open. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Do you, do you have any um, additional comments, David, uh, to add to that? No, I, there was a bill that got tabled yesterday. Well, first of all, back to the uh, pounding it to the flower, Wes. Um, uh, they did pound it to the flower. It, now, it did approve. It did pass um, at with amended, and it was reduced from forty million to five million. So, <laughs> hooray! But it did pass. Um, the um, the a bill I was um, actually kind of had some hopeful for, which doesn't benefit providers at all, was Senate Bill 502, which is interesting. It's a bill that I helped to craft with um, Senator Lentz, and it was to provide actually those who are subsidizing nursing homes today, those who are paying privately. Wes talked about, you know, hey, I can, you know, if I have to raise my rates, you know, to the private pay people because uh, Senate, um, because Representative uh, Jane Gillette said that's what he should do. Well, that means it's a statement that the private pay people then should subsidize for the responsibility of the state. So Senate Bill 502 strive to provide a tax credit for private pay folks who are paying more than the Medicaid rate because they're truly doing the work of, of the state. 
And so um, uh, that bill got um, tabled though, which means it was killed. And um, and that was unfortunate, but that was a bill that didn't even help me. I was just trying to help our private pay families that we have extraordinarily increased the rates of probably over uh, 20 to 25% over the last three to four years. Thank you, David. I see um, um, Eleanor has her hand up again, and I'll just say to everyone, this will be our last call. So um, uh, let's uh, we'll we'll wrap it up then. And uh, Eleanor, I think you. Um, yes. One thing I was going to contact um, Representative Kafer about is what happened to the twenty-four million dollars budgeted for nursing homes. It disappeared, and it was a surplus. And every time I call the uh, appropriate department, they do not call back. That is the one question they will not respond to. Where did it go and why did it go? Are you talking about the funding for nursing homes that during the interim has been transferred out of the nursing home budget by the Department yes. of Health and Human Services? Yes. I called the okay, department I to the department. The answers have stopped. Okay, I can send you the graph. In a nutshell, what happened is, uh, while well, nursing homes were meeting with the department, and clearly, and not just nursing homes, I mean, all of the advocates across all of the populations we've talked about, at the same time that folks were meeting with the department specific to your question, nursing homes, uh, people from the nursing home community, they were meeting with the department, clearly asking for help over the past two years. At that same time, the budget for nursing homes was uh, being transferred out to solve other problems in the state's budget. So that's where it went. And I can send you the graph to show you exactly where it went. One of the places was uh, the state run nursing home. And I, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to in any way demonize state run facilities. It's just that the, the treatment needs to be fair across the board. And so I, I'll send you that graph. And I also will send out, if this is all right, the testimony by John and Carol, and then the numbers I, I quoted on the closure of group homes and exiting people out of services, thousands of people out of services with nowhere to go by aware. So I could send you those two documents as well, if Thank that's you. okay. Yeah, Thank you. Mary, Thank you. we'll send that to the whole group, if that's okay. And I think Kaylee has one more question and then we'll, we'll, we'll close off. And um, so go ahead, Kaylee, if you still have a question. Or Kayla, sorry. I'm really having trouble with names today. <laughs> I did not have a question, oh. but I had actually asked DPHHS the same uh, the same thing um, about the twenty some million each year. I think that disappeared, and hoping for an answer today too. So, um, I would love to see that graph as well, Representative Cafaro. Thanks. All right. Well, um, I really want to thank the um, panel and sponsor Mary, Representative Mary Cafaro, who is just a warrior uh, champion on behalf of our vulnerable Montanans and has um, slayed dragons in the past. So we hope that she will uh, continue to succeed. And um, we thank you, the journalists. I've been really, really impressed with the, um, even before the session with your hard work and um, getting out in front of this issue and telling Montanans and what I find when I talk to people is they are acutely aware of what is happening with the um, with with senior long term care and other um, other providers and recipients of these vital services. Uh, maybe not as much as they should be in terms of how many group homes have closed, how this affects children with behavioral serious behavioral health concerns, and how this affects adults living with disabilities in our communities. So. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, with that, we will uh, go ahead and we've got your contact information. We will um, share the contact information with our panel. Um, John and Carol, I might need your phone number if that's okay to share with um, to share with uh, the journalists who joined us in case they have a follow up question. I think I have phone numbers for the rest of us. So um, we'll get that out to you. And thank you all for being here. Thank, Thank you, you Mark. Record.